it's very good to talk to you, Tama. Um, your background is certainly fascinating, and we certainly have a, a lot in common. I think it'd be best to start uh, with a little bit about your personal history and your life story, where you started and how you ended up where you are now. How long have you got? <laughs> but, um, basically, um, I guess I guess the thing I would say is that um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and my family was Orthodox Jewish. And so uh, I grew up in that culture. And um, I there was something inside me that felt different than my family. I I'd had this desire to write. That was my dream. I loved writing. Um, and when I shared it with my family, it was more like, you're going to write? You're going to starve? You're going to write? You know, it was just completely completely this was not kosher this was not the acceptable path to take in one's life and so like many people you know my my family was concerned about being practical and reasonable and so um and so i just shut down that dream i shut down everything and uh i went off to law school because that was the prescribed path and i got into harvard law school and i graduated with honors from harvard law school and my mother was very grateful and bragging in every synagogue. Um, and I went on to practice law in a major law firm, and I was really, really unhappy. I felt really, really empty. And it was terrifying because I had what you're supposed to have. I had the traditional version of success or what my culture was, you know, told me what success was. But I just kept I, I actually ended up feeling more bereft, like something must be really, really wrong with me, you know, because if if I have what you're supposed to have and and I'm sad and I'm depressed, there's something really, really wrong with me. Um, and thank God a friend of mine at the time said something amazing. And he said, you know, if you've been this successful and you haven't even done what you love, what could you do with what you love? And so that's what started my entire adult spiritual journey of because I finally walked out of that law practice and I just thought, I have one life. I want to know what would happen if I listened to this inner voice in me? What would happen, this, this intuition, this hunger, this desire, this relentless feeling that I wasn't in the right life, I wasn't in the right life. And so that's really what started this whole journey of, for me, of becoming a writer and then a speaker and a coach and of, uh, but, but, it, but also my spiritual journey. You know, I, I would not, I had not defined myself as a spiritual person before, but I think, I think for many of us, pain will awaken that, you know, that, that pain or that the old ways are not working. I need something else. So that's the, the quickie version of how this started. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. Well, maybe you could uh, focus in a little bit about your specific spiritual awakening, what triggered it, and uh, how you began to work with it. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I I was really resistant to a spiritual path. I you know I I had a lot of judgments or ideas of what that was. Um, you know, I'd come from a very skeptical New York City. Came from a very skeptical culture, being a lawyer. Uh, but I was in pain, you know, and, and all the old ways weren't working. And, and, uh, I started reading a lot of self-help books. I started reading all kinds of things. I had a boyfriend at the time who, uh, was studying A Course in Miracles, you know, uh, and which is a spiritual psychotherapy book, uh, an incredible, incredible, amazing work, which I'm happy to talk more about because that's my path of, but he was studying it at the time. And so he kept encouraging me to read it and open-minded wonder that I am. I was saying, get that junk away from me. You know, like I, I don't, I'm not interested. I don't want to read it. So what he did, he was smart. He, um, he started teaching me things without telling me what it was, you know, it's like, so he'd start teaching me concepts and, I'd be like, that's amazing. That's incredible. And he's like, it's in that blue book you won't look at, you know? And so I finally, this is, this is my spiritual path. I finally made him a deal. And I said, I will tell you what, 
I'm going to read that book line by line, and I'm going to read it like a lawyer, and I'm going to show you how you know, silly it is, and then you can't ever talk to me about it again. And so he's like, deal. I've been reading that book for the rest of my life. That was a good 30 something years ago. Uh, it has blown me away. And the spiritual awakening, I, I can't say that I had one moment of, you know, all of a sudden everything opened up for me. My entire life has been a continuous spiritual awakening. It's been a continuous journey of going beyond fear and going into a deeper faith. And it's a continuous conversation. And, and I guess, I, I guess if I'm thinking about it, what the real awakening was is I think I found what I'll call God or spirit for me. I found that through writing, you know, because that was my, that was my calling. And when I when I was writing, I would feel alive and and something larger than me and something more gracious than me and more incredible than me. And I had this one moment where I finally thought, maybe this is what people mean by God. Maybe this is what people mean by spirituality, because I was open to something larger and more connected and and so for me, that's that was like the felt sense of it. But there's been so many moments of it continuously. Well, of course, I agree with you entirely about A Course in Miracles <laughs> and about its depth and importance. And I've studied it for a long time myself, but many of our viewers probably haven't or only barely heard of it. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the course and um, what it entails and what it does. Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> and, you know, and, and like with any spiritual discipline, uh, you know, there's, there's so many different teachers and different flavors and different angles. A Course in Miracles is this incredible spiritual path. And there are many spiritual teachers that might have different, different vibrations or angles or perspectives with it. So I'll just share mine of, and what I would say, if, if you're new to the course, uh, what it is, is it's, it's a mindset training. It's a mindset training that helps you live in love instead of fear. And while that sounds so, oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> what you don't know is that it means you're going to face your fears. You know, it means that you are, because I thought, oh, love instead of fear, that sounds lovely. You know, but but what what it does, what it means is that we start undoing all of our habitual ways of thinking, our conditioning, our, our automatic patterns. So in my life, for instance, when I was, you know, I was told to practice law, that was a safe path, that was the practical path. It never occurred to me that that was fear. Many of us are living what we think is reasonable lives or practical lives, but it's coming from fear. And when the Course in Miracles uses the word fear, it doesn't just mean terror or anxiety. Uh, it means anything that disconnects you from your love, anything that disconnects you from your wholeness. And one of the things The Course in Miracles works with us on is discovering that we are not who we think we are. We are not who we think we are. We think we are limited. We think our success comes from certain forms or achievements. We think that uh, if we do things a certain way, we'll be happy. We, we have all these ideas about who we are. Maybe some of you are listening and thinking, well, I'm too old, or I don't have enough education, or uh, I, I don't have this or that. The Course in Miracles teaches us that our true identity is connected to this infinite love and that what our real life purpose is here the the reason you know the reason to come alive while we're in this lifetime is really to listen to what the course of miracles calls the holy spirit uh, or it could be the spirit of wholeness, the inspirer, the comforter, uh, anything that is your inner voice, your inner teacher that we are here to listen to that voice instead of the smaller voice within us, the habitual voice, the patterned voice. 
And that's challenging because we live in a culture 24 seven where we are be being conditioned and shown that, you know, we're limited, but if we buy, if we buy the latest, you know, Chevy rat or the RAV4 or whatever it is, we'll be okay. You know, of, and it's challenging to really decide, I want to trust this intuition I have, because every single one of us has it. It comes in different ways. It comes in different forms. But The Course in Miracles is this brilliant system of mindset training that literally walks us through how to do that and to introduce us to our inner teacher uh, and how to do that. And, and some of what it does, again, it can be really challenging because it's going to encourage you to think in ways that might not be comfortable or usual for you. So for example, I was reading The Course in Miracles or studying a spiritual path because I got hooked because that same boyfriend had said, oh, if you want to succeed in life, which was my drive, you know, if you want to succeed in life, opening up to your spirituality will help you. And I thought, oh, great, I'm in, you know, of I want to learn how to be infinite and strong. All of that appealed to me. When I read The Course in Miracles, it's all about giving and serving and really seeing the light in someone else. And it really, it, it, it invites us to take mental stances that we might not have taken because they work. They really work. They may, they may be completely opposite to what you normally would have done. You know, like an example, like in business, right? You think you're trained, well, if I want to be successful, I should get ahead. I should work harder and get ahead. Of course, miracles might teach us that, no, I'm here to give. I'm really here to give. I'm not here to even get a result. I'm here to, I'm here to give of my light, which the habitual brain will say, well, then I'll be bankrupt. <laughs> you know, like, oh, great, that person will be served, but what about me? But what I've learned with A Course in Miracles, which is why I cherish it, it is this deep, profound teaching that is so practical that you can use every single day. What I've learned is that if I try it and if I use it, even if I'm uncomfortable and I'm scared, it works. It shows me a different reality. It shows me a flow or a connection or just a way to live in an inspired way that I could never have done on my own. And so it's just a, it's a brilliant system. Well, Tana, that's extremely interesting, uh, but I want to show people what The Course in Miracles is. It's this book. Mm -hmm. The earliest editions were three volumes. This is one volume. Uh, I think you had mentioned a blue book. It's, you know, most, if not, most editions are blue. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what it looks like. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about its origins and its background, because some people might say, wow, that looks kind of culty. <laughs> One of the things, again, I love that you brought the book out. Thank you. Of And within that book, it's there's a text, there's a workbook, there's a manual for teachers. And the beautiful, so it, it is the exact opposite of a cult. Because the one thing that the Course in Miracles uh, says is that we each have an inner teacher. And so that no one of us is the teacher, uh, that there's no particular religious leader in this, is that we're we're all teachers. Uh, and so, um, and it's a self-study path. You don't ever have to take a class. You don't ever have to join a group. You don't ever have to study with anybody. Many of us do choose that because there is so much strength in being with like-minded people and discussion and, and uh and, and really looking at how to apply that. And sometimes also, you know, you read a book on your own and you have your own interpretations. And sometimes it's very helpful to, to hear somebody else's take on that or interpretation on it. Uh, but truly it's a self-study path. You don't ever have to do anything. And I, I can give the quickie background on how it came to be, if that's what you'd like of uh, my, my remembrance of it. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. And I, I may botch some of the details, but I'm, I think I have most of them. Um, Helen Shuckman was, um, do you remember? She was a psychiatrist. Um, yeah. A psychologist. Psychologist. Uh, okay. Columbia Presbyterian. Yeah. Columbia. yeah. So New she, York. So um, Helen Chuckman was a psychologist at uh, Columbia University and uh, 
was uh, experiencing a lot of backbiting, a lot of challenges in the department. And she just kept feeling like there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. You know, we're we're supposedly, you know, guiding human, you know, humans on how to be better and we're fighting. There has to be a better way. And she says, as if on command, she heard an inner voice and it said, you know, there is there is another way. Um, please take notes. Right. And so she literally started hearing a voice saying, This is a course of miracles, please take notes. And being a psychologist, she, of course, was concerned about her mental health, you know, and so she she had thought, oh, my God, I'm hearing a voice. Is, is, am I sane? Is this OK? And so she went to speak to a colleague, Bill Thetford, and um, and she told him about it in private. And he said, well, is the voice asking you to harm yourself? Is it dangerous? And she said, no, actually, it's the most loving voice I've ever heard. And so he said, well, let, let's see where it goes. So she literally heard this voice and took these notes and literally it was automatic dictation. She could literally stop in the middle of a sentence, take a phone call, come back and it would continue. Uh, and again, she was a very academic person. She was an atheist. She was also Jewish to begin with. And then she studied Catholicism, but then she landed on atheism, rejecting everything. So she was not a likely candidate for, you know, receiving this holy text, you know, that, um, again, you know, she, she believed and many believe that it's the voice of Jesus that is speaking, you know, it, uh, the Course in Miracles will say it's not necessary that you believe that or that you believe in Jesus, but it, it does announce itself that way. Um, and so what I find really inspiring about this is that this was not somebody who was looking to garner attention. This wasn't somebody who was looking to create a cult or whatever. This was somebody who actively resisted it. And yet this voice spoke to her. I think it was a period of seven years that she took down this dedication, you know, and kept going. Uh, and that is and that is how the Course of Miracles came to be. And she asked that her name never be on it because she didn't want to cult. She didn't want to be the teacher. Uh, she also was concerned about her academic reputation. Um, and so I find this story incredibly uh, moving because for me, that was really helpful when I when I came upon it. You know, it's funny because some people will say, oh, it's more valid because it's channeled. You know, it's like for me, that wasn't necessarily a sell. <laughs> you know, like for me, the word channeled was a little scary. But because she was so intelligent, intelligent and reputable and was doing it because it was truly a calling and by the way, she didn't edit anything. Uh, another incredible facet of it was she was um, she was a stickler about grammar. And she had said to the voice, if there is one grammatical error here, I'm out, you know, and it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. And uh, it also, as a gift to Helen, um, the voice wrote in iambic pentameter, which is a poetic meter. Um, and uh, just just as a gift to her, you know, to um, and so I think it's an amazing experience. It's also an amazing testament to the possibilities that live within each of us, the possibilities that are available to each of us if we stop limiting ourselves and limiting what's possible and just even experiment and explore. And that book has gone on to affect millions of people around the world and, and globally and uh, of just and her courage to follow that, you know, to her courage to follow that was pretty amazing. And and one of the things I've also loved is she has she's been quoted as saying, I know that every single word of this is true. I know it is. And I can't always believe it. And I love that because it's it's that dichotomy. It's the same thing for me. I feel the exact same way. I know this is true. And the reason I know that for me, there's an energy there or an authority in this material that for me speaks to me like nothing else. There's just an authority. And I know it's true. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life practicing and believing because I'm human. And because that's my spiritual path is to come into alignment with it. Um, 
and and loving my humanity as I go. And so for many of us who are on spiritual paths, it, it's just a good awareness to know that you may have, you may know something intellectually, or you may know something, but the practice of it, the integration of it is going to take, is going to take a while for most of us. And that we want to accept and love and cherish our humanity as we go, because it's our, it's our own ultimate healing, you know, and Again, one of the things I love about The Course in Miracles, it acknowledges that. You know, like if you're doing the workbook, it'll literally have places where it'll say, you know, if your mind is wandering right now, that's okay. Don't force this. You know, don't don't increase fear. We're trying to undo fear. Don't increase fear. I find that amazing. You know, I feel like that book talks to me, you know, of, and I will say also personally, one of the reasons I chose to teach it as much as I am, you know, saying I love the book and I cherish it, and I do, I have also been really challenged with it. It's, it, you know, for me, it's a challenging read. It might not be for someone else. I, I don't want to say that. But I've learned that for many people, they may be, like you said, when you showed the book, they may be put off thinking, whoa, that looks big or that looks hard or that looks whatever. It's one of the reasons I chose to teach Course in Miracles is because there's so much incredible juice in it. And whether or not somebody ever studies the book, I wanted to be able to give them the practical applications right now. And usually what will happen is, at least in my, in my classes many times, is that I just want to show you this works because that's what the Course in Miracles says. It literally says, you don't have to believe this. You don't have to like it. Some of the ideas you might find offensive, but you have to try. If you try it, it will work. And your and because it works, you will have faith, right? So that's what I do in my classes. I really like to try to make it very practical, very real world. Like we talk, we discuss, you know, well, okay, how do you do this in in real time? You know, in your relationship or in your career, that kind of thing. But um, it's an amazing it's an amazing work because it's this profound teaching, but it is so useful in everyday life. That's what I love about it. Well, thank you. That's very good. I want to say that I've studied the course for 42 years myself, and I want to endorse everything you say about it, both factually and um, on a feeling level. So uh, I agree with you entirely. Um, let's go on to a subject that has kind of come up already. Uh, and which definitely comes up for pretty much anyone, which is the subject of resistance. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everyone who uh, encounters the Course mm -hmm. finds some resistance to it, feels some resistance. It may be vehement, it may uh, come later, but there's there's sometimes that people just kind of hit a block with it. Um, what are the most common forms of resistance that uh, you've seen in yourself and others? And how do you suggest dealing with them? You know, um, that's a great question. And uh, I think people do resist it. Um, I think, and, and to your point, I think, I think that we resist anything that is enlarging us. So I work a lot in the creativity realm. So I work a lot coaching people into their calling and finding their dreams and their calling. And it's amazing how much resistance there is to that, right? You know, like you find your dream, you, you wanna you wanna paint or you wanna do music and there's incredible resistance to that. It's almost like anything that's healthy for us. I mean, probably all of us recognize that with exercise, we all know, gee, it would be good for us, but there's this incredible uh, resistance I think, I think that there is, it's almost like habitual that there's like this drive to stay the same, this drive to stay with what I know, what I know. The, I, I'm uncomfortable, but this, but it feels comfortable, right? And I, you know, and so people, I think in, in the Course of Miracles specifically, I think people start off with the amazement of it like oh my god i could listen to this inner voice i could i could open up to these higher capacities yes i want that but as you go deeper with any work whether it's course miracles whether it's creativity whether it's anything you're going to hit your blocks and that's the point of the path the course miracles actually says 
that we are here to undo the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. We are here to undo the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. Meaning love is always present. The miracle is always present. That's a given. But, but our awareness of it isn't. And each of us has different blocks that come up. And we're not doing it wrong because those blocks come up. It's not like, oh my God, you're failing now. You didn't do it right. It's actually that they're supposed to come up because that's going to be the, the vortex or the crucible of our healing, right? That's going to be the thing we face, right? So, um, so I think for many of us, you know, I think there's a, a tendency, sometimes people might think, well, it's not practical. You know, I don't, I don't want to love somebody else. I don't want to forgive them. I want to, you know, I want to, you know, like I'll always be in the place where I'm thinking I want relief from my mind or whatever. And then I'm opening my lesson for the day and it's like forgiveness. It's like, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> I want the fun lesson where it tells me I'm a light, you know, of, you know, any, I think any work of depth, whether it's, again, whether it's a spiritual path or uh, your calling, your dream, your business, your marriage, your anything, it's going to call you to go deeper. It's going to call you to go into the places that you're not good. You know, I, I like hanging out in the places where I'm good, you know, where I can shine, where I can look good. I don't love going into the places where I don't. And the Course in Miracles has helped me so much because A, it's helped me have mercy for those places and to realize this is my path. Where I'm blocked, I always tell people where you're blocked, that's a portal, right? Where you're blocked, this is going to be a portal. There's a lot of energy there where you're blocked. And so you're learning to rise above, like you said, that resistance, that that initial no. And I have no idea why it is, but I think there is something in all of us that just resists that getting larger, you know, that, that, you know, really it's that letting go of control. I think that's another huge one, right? That, that would be one of mine It's like, okay, God, I really love what you've done so far. I'm going to take it from here. <laughs> you know, like this, this is good. Um, until of course I hit another, you know, problem and then I'm, you know, but I think a real, a true inspired life is a life of letting go of control and moving into trust. You know, I kept thinking I wanted, I wanted better control. And what I'm really learning is as much as I think I want control, it's not control, it's trust. And it's trusting in something higher and it's trusting in something more. And one of the things The Course in Miracles teaches us is that we don't always perceive our own highest good. We don't always perceive our own highest good. And so we may be on track for one thing and it may not happen the way that you think, but that's going to be in your highest good because something else is going to emerge and or your healing in that process is going to take you somewhere deeper. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I was just talking to a client last night, actually. And um, she's, you know, I, again, I work with people finding their dreams and their calling and that whatever. And so she, uh, she's a musician and she planned on doing all this, these things of finally getting her music in order and touring and whatever. And her mother got sick and she's moved home to be with her mother and be caretaking. This is not her plan. This was not what she thought was the next right step on her career path. But what she's finding is that it's opening her heart, like caretaking and really being with her mother is healing something, healing the relationship with her mother. It's opening her heart. It's actually calming her down and it's actually expanding her ability to do what's next in her music. Nobody from their conscious mind would say, oh, that's a good plan, right? If you want to get ahead in your music, make sure your mother gets sick. Nobody from their conscious mind is going to say, well, that's the plan. But what A Course in Miracles teaches us over and over and over is that I open to whatever my life is, not the ideal life, not what I think it should be, not what I think it could be, but right here, right now, and I know that there is something here for me if I practice these principles. And it doesn't mean I give up on my dreams or my desires, but I also surrender them to something larger that's informing me. And I also always remember for me that my real desires are coming from that spirit. And if they're coming from that spirit, 
I'm going to have a way and I only want what's really right for me. I only want that. My brain will entertain other ideas, right? But so I think resistance is initially, it it's scary to trust that because then you hear, you hear other ideologies of, well, you're just sacrificing. Oh, well, you're just settling. Oh, you're just abdicating responsibility and giving it to a higher power. And it's such a rigorous walk of so much goodness and finding your way in it because all of us are different and, and the chemistry of it is different. My healing might be to let go more. Your healing might be to speak up more. You know, that the spirit within us, each of us is going to call us in our own unique ways. Well, that's beautiful. I certainly find that all very apt. Uh, I wrote a book on uh, forgiveness myself called The Deal, which was heavily influenced by the course. And my impressions with it, which it's a book on radical and complete forgiveness, that's the subtitle. Mm -hmm. And my experience with it um, and with the course in general is that uh, a major source of resistance is what, exi what the course would say is the opposite of the truth. Mm -hmm. Because I see in myself and others the completely incorrect belief that my fears and my grievances are protecting me. Whereas the course is actually saying, these are the things that are sabotaging you. These are your fears, your grievances are your only real enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, a, a reason we resist that, right? That So we, so part of the reason for that is I might have a grievance against someone else saying, I would be happy if my boss was nicer to me. You know, he really needs to be nice to me. That would be what A Course in Miracles would call a grievance. And, and what it does is it's taking away your power because it's saying my happiness depends on what this person does or doesn't do, whether they are in their light or not, right? That And so The Course in Miracles for me um, has helped me so much to strengthen who I am and to be in that light and to be in that strength, no matter what someone else is doing. And to take back, like you said, forgiveness, to take back these ideas that I'm projecting on somebody else, these ideas that they are doing this to me. Because again, what A Course in Miracles would say is everybody's coming from love or they're coming from fear. You know, or, or also say, or they're calling for love, right? Another way to say that is so that Someone who's not in their right mind, who's in fear, who's not connected to their source, maybe acts in a certain way, and you take it to mean something about you. That's disempowering to you. So we want to look at those grievances and we want to take them back. So I'll give you a personal example of because I, I, you know, I, I've published books and it's been terrifying on this journey to trust this inner voice, to write the, you know, write a book and to believe that maybe someday I'd get it published and, you know, or how, or to the, do the business. And I've been committed, my, my personal walk, which has been challenging, has been, I've been committed to growing my business and my work through, through my spiritual practice. I am not as interested in the typical commercial practices. I want to succeed. I love succeeding. That is not, you know, but I really want to follow, follow that inner voice in business as well, in anything, right? Like for me, I want to follow it everywhere. And so that's always been a challenge because, you know, I will hold grievances, like I'll hold a grievance of it's not fair. Other people have a publicist and they have money and they can promote their books to the, but it's not fair, right? And so that grievance took a lot of my energy away from my path. It was not, sir, I believed it. Other people might even support it saying, yes, that's true in the world, blah, blah, blah. But what my own healing was is that's so disempowering to imagine that my path, my real path relies on something external that way, because I deeply believe, and I've had evidence of it in my own life, of every single book I've ever written and every book I've gotten published, it happened through, I, I deeply believe, through inspired means. I mean, things that couldn't, should have happened, happened, of things I could not have made happen myself. And so 
I finally realized like that grievance, your mind just habitually goes that way and habitually focuses that way. And I had to keep drawing it back. I had to keep coming back to what's my responsibility. I'm going to show up as much love and excellence as I possibly can. I'm going to represent my messages as best I can. I'm going to do whatever I'm given to do. I'm going to do the work in front of me if I'm guided to do something, if there is an inspired action. But I had to keep taking away my mindset from the grievances of, but this and, but they or comparisons, another one of mine, like, but they have that and I don't have this and, you know, and just all of those kinds of things. And I have to continuously come back to listening to that beautiful inner voice that for me has brought me on a singular journey, just a singular journey of, you know, and you, you mentioned something and I was just going to read something very briefly, um, uh, just it's from Thriving Through Uncertainty, my, which doesn't show up, but that's okay. Um, just because we were talking about this, and I just thought, again, this is part of the resistance, is that we, we're trying to cope and we're trying to make things happen. And so I'm just, just sharing this for a second. There's two lines. You may feel like things are challenging at this moment in your life, but let's get this straight right now. It's not because you're failing or broken. It's because your spirit demands soaring, not coping. It's your time. And so I wanted to share that because in Thriving Through Uncertainty, it's the same thing that we're talking about, is that uh, so much of our grievances and so much of our pain is trying to keep control with what we know and cope. And and also to we're attacking ourselves because grievances aren't just about other people. I spend a lot of my grievances on myself. I'm not even as worried about other people. I have so many grievances with me of, I could have done that. I should have done that. Why aren't I more this? Why aren't I like them? You know, why didn't I, all of those things. And that attack on self, I think is blasphemy. I think that attack on self, same thing, is the grievances that hold us back because we think we're failing or broken because things are changing. It's an interpretation we're putting on things. We're putting a meaning on something that says, oh, this didn't happen. It's because I'm failing. And I think a spiritual path would say, no, it didn't happen because you're about to expand. There's something else here. There's something, another growth for you. So many of us are going through this in the world at this time. We're seeing so many changes in the world. We're seeing so much turbulence in the world, so much divisiveness, hatred, whatever. I think the old systems are falling apart. I think many, many of us are in uncertainty uh, because th the old ways are falling apart. And one of the things I teach in Thriving Through Uncertainty is your life isn't falling apart. Your old life is falling apart. Your life isn't falling apart. Your old life is falling apart. This new life, this greater life is emerging. But we have to stop attacking ourselves so that we can hear something else. So if you get nothing else out of this talk, by the way, I, I will I will just bottom line it here. If, if people got nothing else out of this talk, I would just say, if you dared to love yourself more and be kinder to yourself, you will hear the spiritual voice within you more. It's, it is impossible to hear spirit's voice while you are being judgmental of yourself or of anybody else, by the way. But you will not hear, you will not hear that inspiration, that love, that genius, that, that connection while you're judging yourself. So if you get nothing else out of this, truly, if you would spend a moment just being kinder and truly loving of yourself, you're that much closer to hearing that love that's inside you, that's infinite inside you. And I believe you have gifts to give this planet and gifts to give this world. And the more that you are listening to that love, you're going to be more of service, not less of service. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. I couldn't help noticing your earrings, which are very beautiful color. <laughs> um, uh, and they match your nails, which are also a beautiful <laughs> color. And they pick up the, the cover of your book, A uh, Year Without Fear. Um, <laughs> so maybe we could turn to A Year Without Fear. So tell us about how to live a year without fear. I'd be happy to. So A Year Without Fear is um it's a it's a daily reader you know of 
it's just a daily, it's, I shouldn't say it's just a daily reader. It's a daily reader of so many of my clients, you know, kept saying, I want to be inspired. Could you give me one nugget? Can you give me one tip? Could you give me one, you know, whatever. And so I decided um, in a year without fear to, again, translate some of the concepts of The Course in Miracles, but also uh, some of the concepts in finding your dream, your path, uh, and to make it a nugget of reading, like a mindset shift for that day, what, you know, one thing for that day, and then one thing you could do. So today's March 22nd. Let's go look at what March 22nd is, <laughs> just in case it's relevant. Um, hopefully it's a good one. Um, let's see, it is March 22nd, right? Yes, I'll, I'll just read it to you just briefly, just so you get an idea. So, um, oh, perfect. Um, I know this one. It is on the invisible levels that we create ourselves and our lives. The sweetest declarations take place, mostly unwitnessed. This is where we decide who we will be. It's the moment we decide to go to the gym, even when we're jiggling in Lycra. It's asking for a date, a raise, or a connection while shaking and baking inside. It's showing up knowing you're a great friend or rock star, even when no one shows up for you, yet. Today, I know that it's on the invisible levels that I decide who I am. But it's kind of what we're talking about is just that it's on the invisible levels that we make the most changes in our lives. You know, most people are thinking it's all about the actions and I have to do this or I have to do that but it's the invisible levels that nobody else sees that when you decide I'm going to show up for myself, I'm going to show up for my life. I'm going to dare this. I'm going to, I'm going to dare to do something when nobody else is looking and to really be there for yourself. That's how things change. They don't, they don't happen. They don't change externally. Things will happen the same way over and over and over again and until we change internally. It's those invisible levels where you make that choice. I'm going to be kinder to myself. I'm going to listen to something else and I'm going to show up in this world whether or not it's showing up for me. Um, but many people when facing the course and facing ideas like those that you've just been uh, putting forth, immediately have the objection, what does this all have to do with the terrible state of the world? Mm. You know, I'm talking about self-love. I'm talking about forgiveness. I'm talking about letting go of my grievances. When all these terrible things are going, how uh, do you suggest that someone cope with those objections? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. Um, and and comes up often is that how is this going like you said how is this going to serve you know the, a war torn country that I'm listening to an inner voice now and being kinder to myself. Course in Miracles would say that um, for first of all, I'll back up for a second. How is it how is it going to serve a war torn country that you're being cruel to yourself? <laughs> I mean, just like basics here, how is we don't need one more person who's miserable and angry and conflicted inside themselves. That is not helping our world either. So, you know, there's always the, in the spiritual realms, there's always the concept of peace begins with me. That is not a small thought, you know, of that we, each of us individually if we address our own consciousness and we become the fullest version of ourselves we could possibly be, we are now doing what we can in the world. I can't affect it. I mean, there's so many causes I would love to serve. I would love to serve environmentalism. I would love to serve, you know, uh, war-torn whatever or, or different rights or, I mean, but I've had to be honest and say, okay, what is mine to do? What is my calling? What is, what is my area? And I believe, I know, because my work has now affected thousands of people, thank God, of that I'm, I'm bringing that light out and affecting them and they're affecting someone else and they're affecting someone else and they're affecting someone else and they're affecting someone else. And, someone else. and so, and it doesn't even mean that, oh, now you have to go write a book or now you have to go, you know, be a world leader or anything like that. Never underestimate the power of a peaceful mind. Never underestimate the authority 
of you coming to kindness within yourself. I have a, I have a simple example. This was many years ago. I was really, really hurting. I was in a relationship and it went, it went south and there was other things going on in my life. And um, I was in so much pain and it was, I was really struggling. I was really starting to feel like, again, like almost on the verge of depression, on the verge of suicidal. I was just really, really upset. And I remember one day I was walking and I was feeling, I, part of it was this story that I'm so alone. I'm just really alone, you know, and, and this person had left me and I'm alone. And, and I was walking down the street one day and it was a pretty spring day and there was a, a young woman and she was gardening and she looked up at me for just a second and she just smiled. You know, she was just in her garden and she was really happy and she was just radiant and she just smiled at me. And there was something that I swear to God just healed my soul in that moment. It was just, it was just a simple thing. She just looked up at me in this innocent and love. And I I felt connected to humanity again. I felt like I, I belong somehow. I felt like maybe there would be hope. She never knew that. She was just gardening in her yard, you know, and she was just in a peaceful, happy moment. She didn't know that she she made all the difference to me at that time in my life. I've probably shared this story a lot in different classes. So it's gone on and on. Never underestimate what we can do with peace. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've had a lot of, my mother's no longer alive, but I used to have a lot of conflicts with her because, you know, she was my nemesis. Like, you know, you're doing what now? You're, you're writing books? Like, well, you know, where's that going to go? I mean, so I would, I would always have different um, turmoil with her because again, grievance, it wasn't her. It was, she brought up my fears. She validated things I already had inside myself, right? It wasn't what she was saying. It was that I believed it, that I had something in me, in me that agreed with it. But, you know, towards the end of her life, I had been practicing the course a lot and I had moments of pure joy and love and peace with her. And my mother even said to me at one point, which is I cherish for the rest of my life. She at one point said, you've been the most loving person in my life. And that like was amazing. So I remember thinking at the time, you know, the Middle East can come to peace. If I can do this with my mother, if enough of us were doing this, we have no idea what's possible. You know, and so it's very painful when we have a lot of conflict and turmoil in the world to say, and it's very tempting to say, this is how it will always be. Why bother? What is my little contribution going to do? But it's not how it will always be. Of course, Miracles teaches us constantly, this is just a moment, you know, and the past doesn't create the future, the present does. And who will you be in this moment? Because on a metaphysical level, it's also that when I'm in my light and my strength, my mind connects to yours and yours connects to mine. And we connect with who knows? And some dictator wakes up one day and feels better. Who knows? It, it won't be a logical thing. It won't be a linear thing. It will be a mystical thing. It will be a creative thing. And so, again, I think sometimes people, I've heard a resistance to the Course in Miracles of, you know, how is this going to help the people, you know, starving children in Africa? Or how is, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But sometimes, the you know, that can be a defense, too, of a smaller mind, that it's an easy way to opt out of practice, right? Like this is your lifetime. This is your one lifetime. Connect with the powerful within you because it changes you. Never even mind the world, it changes you. And the Course in Miracles says that if you are changed, we are changed. If you are changed, we're changed. One of the best ways I help my clients in career coaching or whatever, it's not so much my brilliant advice, not so much my techniques or anything. I think the real way is because I know it works. And the only reason I know it works is because I've done it. And because I've done it, I'm healed in that arena. So I can help heal somebody else in that arena. So when you heal yourself, you make peace with your ex-husband, you find a way to give in a, in a way that you never could, you find a way to be peaceful and conflict-free and joyful, it's going to heal other people in ways you can't imagine. It's going to give them possibilities. And for me, that's really what, the, all the conflict that's going on in the world, it's calling for new solutions.
It's calling for new gifts. It's calling for new contributions. It's calling, if you have a book to write, it's time to write it. If you're guided to do music, it's time to do that. If you're a teacher, go teach, whatever it is. If you wanted to run off to India, go run off to India. Because by the way, it doesn't have to be what your brain says is practical. You have no idea where this is going. It's following that inner voice. That's true. And yet, one can't help thinking of all of the people in this complex world that we live in that have to do very, very basic, simple, co commonplace, dull things uh, to keep things going. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible? I knew a woman years ago who worked for the phone company, and her job was to change people's telephone. <laughs> That's what she did. Yes. And you can say, well, um, gee, is this really what I meant to do? And then you can sort of say, well, I should go off to India. I should write a book. I should do mm -hmm. this, that, and the other thing. And yet there are so many things that are very commonplace and very yes. humdrum. Yes. And it, that is the task for many people. Yes. And they, I, they, may not, they may not want to um, accept it. Yes. I think that's a fantastic question of that. We are all going to be in circumstances that are not ideal. We are all going to be at, you know, if we are in a human body, I'm sure that every single one of us has dealt with disease, death, pain, boredom, poverty, fear, everything, right? Again, The Course in Miracles is this amazing translation of one of the basic concepts in it is everything is the interpretation I give it. Everything is the interpretation I give it. Every A miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love. And what that means is I might have an interpretation about something and that, that is causing me pain or an assumption that is causing me pain. And a miracle is when I'm able to undo that thought. And it, first of all, it's just me being willing to see the painful interpretation I'm having, that I'm choosing that uh, interpretation or thought. And I'm willing to see it through the eyes of my spirit. I'm willing to see it differently. So going back to your question, which is an excellent one, is I'm never suggesting that everybody needs to, you know, run off to India or write a book or whatever. Some people might need to do that. Some people need to stay exactly where they are because this is the greatest healing opportunity that we might say it's humdrum to do this job. And everybody might agree with us. Yes, it's humdrum to... But not if you're having a different interpretation, not if you're having a different experience. I, I, um, I was uh, going to the airport um, one time and there was a shuttle driver and he was obviously from a different country and uh, he probably was new, new to the United States. It was amazing. This man had so much light and so much love in him. He was a shuttle driver at the airport. I'm sure he wasn't making a lot of money, you know, but he had so much, he had more happiness and light in him than everybody on that shuttle going off to fancy destinations or something. And to me, that's really the purpose of a spiritual life is not so much that we then accomplish the great things, but it's the journey within it. Like, how will you show up? Because Every place you are, of course, miracles will say that any place you are, it's a holy encounter. Any place you are, it's a place where you could experience something different, right? And so, and even my own journey, I will tell you it's because I love writing books and I love teaching classes and I love leading retreats. But at the end of the day, what it's really about, it's Tama healing Tama. Those are the outside forms, but I believe this is the path that my spirit shows for me to heal me, to go past my fears, because these are this is the path that brings up my fears and brings up my woundedness, and I have to show up and heal it as I go along. So one of the things, of course, Merkel says is that everything is neutral. There's The circumstances are neutral. They're not good or bad. They are the meaning we give to it. And so many of us are saying, well, this is bad, and that's good, and that's high paid, and that's low paid. I invite you to, wherever you are, in whatever situation you are, I invite you to know that you're a light of uncommon amazingness. And whatever circumstance you're in right now, what if that is for your good? What if there's something there to help you shift? 
and to you know there 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 are spiritual seekers that you know uh, I've read different books that were in prison or even Nelson Mandela is a good example right of you know was in prison he found his destiny in prison he found his connection and he became more of a lover of the light so I don't think it's about our circumstances and we have to train ourselves to know that. It makes me think of uh, Lewis, who was a man uh, I knew who was a janitor at a San Francisco laundromat. This was back in the eighties. And he was, you know, he was a janitor in a San Francisco laundromat. This is not <laughs> exactly um, any mother's ambition, but he had that exactly kind of life and that you're exactly talking about. And one does often see that in people in really rather unusual places. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me, we're coming to the end of our time. So let me end by asking you the question I hate most when people ask me, uh, which is, what are you working on next? Where's your, uh, where, where's your next, uh, uh, where's your creative edge taking you at this point? Mm -hmm. Actually, um, I have a new book that's going to come out next year. Um, called learning to trust yourself uh and uh my edge is always there my edge is always learning how to continuously trust myself because trust myself and trust this path because you know so many times people will say oh well you've studied and taught this so you must be there now whatever there is right but it's again if you were if you're working on something, if you're growing, you're going to your next edge always. And for me, that edge is to go deeper into the commitment of trusting, to go deeper into the commitment of trusting. When I say trusting myself, I mean trusting that inner voice. Because I have had miracle after miracle after miracle. You know, my 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 first book, I, I had, you know, I had self-published it initially, and I'd wrote, wrote, wrote it for 12 years believing in this inner voice and daring to trust it and being terrified. Um, and then it got discovered by, you know, I got an email out of the blue from somebody who said, I'm your fairy godmother. And it was actually a publicist uh, for Random House at the time. Uh, just an amazing circumstance. Got it to the publisher I most dreamed of, Tartra Penguin. And, and you know, so I had that experience of, I, I started off in this incredible trust experience and it worked. And you would think, well, I would trust forevermore. But it's just constantly, can you trust now? Can you listen now? Can you dare now? Can you go deeper now? I have a very, you know, the beautiful thing of having a good mind is, yeah, it's great. You have a great mind. Um, the downside of having a great mind is it can argue fear very eloquently too. You know, I'm a former lawyer. And so it can argue very, very well. My inner critic has a Harvard law degree. Not so fun. <laughs> No, and so um, I'm really, really daring to go deeper into trusting all the way, trusting my this voice, trusting these higher resources. Um, and by trusting, I mean doing less, like not not forcing, not manufacturing, uh, you know, and really daring to trust that this is not of me, that this there will be a flow, there will be a way. The, of course, Merkel says nothing real can be threatened, that the things that are right will happen, you know. And so, um, so it's been, um, I, I love this new book. Um, I really used a lot more Course in Miracles in this new book. Um, and it's really, you know, how I talked before about undoing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. This new book, um, really looks at the the blocks that come up for people the most uh, when they're not trusting themselves and it's all about it's all about what you said it's about um they need to forgive themselves they need their they maybe they made a mistake and they need to forgive themselves or maybe they're not listening to the right voice and they need to learn how to listen to love or or maybe you know um they're not they're not trusting the path and they need to learn how to you know open up to that so there's all the different blocks to really undoing those blocks so that the trust and the flow and the energy and the undiluted strength is just there. Well, that's great. Well, of course, it, Miracles itself says doubt will go and come and go again. Uh, and, you know, that it's just part of the process. So, well, we've come to the end of our time. So thank you so much. It's been a um, delightful experience chatting with you. And um, obviously, you and I both agree on the 
from the power and importance of A Course in Miracles. So I want to uh, thank you uh, taking the time and um, I wish you all the may, best with your work and your books. May I, may I mention my website? Um, or, yes, go ahead. Okay. Because uh, I, I would just love to have people join me if, if you're uh, moved at all. Um, my website's tamakeeves.com, but I also have, um, there's a special link that if you use it, it's tamakeeves.com forward slash the word free dash stuff forward slash um that will give you access to i have you know you can choose what you want i have three free coaching videos that you can try to really learn how to listen to that inner voice that those videos will do that there's also um i do fortune cookies that come out by email and inspiring message once a week so if you go to tamakeeves.com forward slash free dash stuff you, you can get anything you want there. And I would love you to join my worldwide community. We are daring to live from inspiration instead of fear. And we're also on social media, Facebook and Instagram and everything else. And I thank you so much for having me and for your dedication. When you said, you know, 42 years of studying this, I am in awe. I am tr truly in awe and, and who you are. And I am so grateful for uh, this organization as well for giving so many tools and be beautiful examples to people, you know, of just because we have a phenomenal world and we all learn differently and there are different teachers and resources for different people. So thank you so much for having me and for the work you do.